Chair, and um, thank you every, everybody for, for coming in. I was actually struck when I was listening to particularly the stats from the IPRT, just how much they reminded me of research published in 2007 by the Association for Criminal Justice Research and Development about the young, young people in the children court. And they looked at a study of 400 young people uh, in the children court at that stage. And although the language is slightly dated in it, um, it's the same, it's exactly the same story. I'm sure many of you may be familiar with it, you know, and just some, some uh, bullet points from that study were the young people who were before the children court, predominantly male, living in specific and recurring disadvantaged localities in each of the areas examined, um, were not in full-time mainstream education, and in fact, 86% of those for whom education available was available on the district court files had no engagement with mainstream education. Um, by far the most common offences were road traffic offences, theft offences and public order offences and the public order offences were, the circumstances of the offences were overwhelmingly linked to alcohol consumption. But again, just as you've spoken about there about the experience in court, young people waited uh, at least six months in, 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 on average um, for their first court appearance with, with, with about 30% having had a court appearance within a month. Had their case concluded within six months of that appearance, made on average eight court appearances in respect of each charge. And so, of course, what you're talking about is a system that brings people to the children court, our young children to the children court, and sort of keeps kept them there, you know, for, for, for a period as they came again and again. And it was notable on the files that um, the, you know, one of the bail conditions that was applied, actually, at the time by the children court, most common bail condition that was applied at the time, was not to attend at, I think it was Court 55, which, of course, was the, the children court in Smithfield, because what was being, what was apparent is that young people were turning up, essentially, you know, too often, not in education, and, 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 and it was becoming just, 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 just too often, um, just too routine. Uh, to be there, and um, and and it's di it's disturbing, you know, that 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 little has changed. On the other hand, um, it's very welcome to hear about the change to the GYDP to is opening up to children as young as eight. That's just so important. But I just wanted to ask you a couple of things, having having just noted that that unfortunately, you know, that um, having noted that uh, specific questions. One, the the impact of the pandemic on the operation of the Garda Youth Diversion Program. And um, so I apologise, I was slightly late. So if you've already addressed that, there's no need to. But in particular, one of the particular concerns I have about the Garda Youth Diversion Programme is when the, um, when the office decides not to take forward a prosecution um, and insists on a welfare-based referral with TUSLA, one of the concerns I have is that there's no oversight about how that's delivered or whether it's delivered. And I'd just like to hear your perspective on that because it seems to me not much point for the Garda office to decide not to refer a child because what they need is a welfare-based intervention, but not necessarily to have clarity that that welfare-based intervention, whether it's um, anger management, sexual therapy, so, some other some other re referral that that has been that has been decided that they should have, that that actually happens and that it has been you know an effective or a successful measure for the child. Uh, so that so just I'd, I'd like to get your perspectives on that, and then I have. If it's possible, a question on the impact of the Victims Directive uh, on restorative justice programmes. You may not get to that, but also just about the the, um, the application of the extension of JARC to 18 to 24 year olds. Ms. Joyce, I think you might be able to address that. Just about perhaps the practicalities of that. It's obviously a period where young people in that category, whom we have identified, may be committing a lot of offences. But it's also the moment of greatest vulnerability for them, um, and it's essential that that be extended so that they get more supports throughout that period, uh, but, but, but really what I'm concerned about, if I could get to anything, is the follow-up on the welfare-based referrals, please. Thank you, Debbie, and is that directed at a particular um, witness or in general? Well, I think the probation service really, um, possibly on the, on, the, on the oversight, but perhaps, um, you know, community workers will, will have, you know, personal knowledge of, of, of people receiving welfare referrals and, and maybe them being followed up or not followed up, I'm not sure. I suppose the spirit of the Children's Act really sets out that, you know, matters of welfare should not, you know, come within the within the the realms of, of the court or the kind of, you know, the criminal justice um, arena and that those matters should, in fact, be dealt with in the appropriate uh, forum. What we find is that the young people that we work with, they have, um, you know, that there is actually the number of young people, say, going forward to Oberstown, is decreasing, um, which signifies that the act, you know, is effective. 
in terms of the conferencing that you've referenced, um, there is a number of conferencing uh, opportunities available under the Children Act, one being family conferencing, which the court can order us to convene. And then we bring back a particular plan to the court, which can be accepted. I'm, I'm sorry, though, that that's, I'm, it's just because of so, 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 so short time. That's not really what I'm referring to, though. It's more where there's a decision not to prosecute, and so it may not be yourself. But it's yeah. about, it's about, I appreciate that they're separate, but what I'm concerned about is, who, is there any, any evidence of oversight of TUSLA in delivering the welfare refer, referrals that have been an alternative to prosecution, as, essentially? As those young people may well be with the, the um, Guardia Diversion or the youth services, they may be best in the position Okay, thank to you. Thanks so much. Thank you. I might just come in there. Um, I think we wouldn't necessarily be aware of that level of oversight. So I suppose in the Garda Youth Diversion Projects, referrals are received from a number of different sources. So one of those sources is the Diversion Programme. Um, so the on Garda Shiakana might refer to the projects. However, if they choose not to refer into the Garda Youth Diversion Projects, the projects wouldn't necessarily have a lot of information on those people, on those young people, because consent wouldn't have been sought to share that information. So that might be a little bit um, outside of our level of knowledge as well in terms of the oversight from a TUSLA point of view. Okay, no problem. I'll pick it up with I'll pick it up with TUSLA more directly. I just wondered if anybody in the sector might have a, a sense of it. Perhaps um, Ms. Joyce on the on the JARC extension and the practicalities of that. Yes, absolutely. So um, we wouldn't be, you know, because we don't work in direct services, I suppose we wouldn't have a, a view and to the exact details of how that's going to be rolled out. I think the point I would make, though, is that the youth justice strategy talks about a pilot approach and, and that's going to be really important to try and progress as soon as possible and, and to not let that kind of sit for too long. Um, and I think really the, the reason that that is so important is that the youth JARC pilot approach is about uh, addressing those young people who are engaged in the most serious type of offending and feedback that we have received previously from those working within guided youth diversion programs and um, is that there is a bit of a sense that sometimes perhaps the most those who are involved in the, the most difficult to reach young people are not actually um, being picked up by the guided youth diversion, diversion programs in all cases obviously and um, many people on this call will be able to speak to that in more detail but that is something that we have heard and I think that there is a, an importance there about actually and um, you know addressing that pilot so that we can kind of really target our interventions at those who really need the help the most and then who potentially are going to cause the most harm if they uh, are not engaged with. Thank you. 